Welcome everybody to Hutch at Home. I'm Jeannie Chowning, Senior Director of Science Education and Training at Fred Hutch, and I welcome everybody. Um, I'm really excited today to um, introduce one of my uh, most respected and admired co colleagues, somebody I really uh, have a lot of es esteem for, um, Raquel Sanchez, who's the Managing Director of Global Oncology at Fred Hutch. And she'll be speaking with us about a global mindset, turning my lived experience into my life's work. And let me see here. And um, really looking forward to hearing about this partnership that Fred Hutch has with um, the Uganda Cancer Institute. Um, global oncology is an important part of the work we do at Fred Hutch. Just a quick reminder that this is a talk geared towards science teachers and students. If you have found your way to us um, and you're not in one of those audiences, um, please prioritize the questions of teachers and students. Please mute yourself if you're not talking, especially if you're connecting via phone. And um, feel free to add, put in your questions into the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat as we go along and take a moment to complete our feedback form at the end of the talk. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to Raquel's slides. So just bear with me for a moment. Okay, okay and then I'm gonna share. All right, here we go. Uh, everything looking okay? Looks okay to me. Okay, so great. And um, just let me know when to advance and um, I'll turn it over now to Raquel. Great, thank you so much, Jeannie, for that kind introduction and for having me speak today. It's truly, it truly is an honor. This is a group that is definitely near and dear to me and I care a lot about. Um, so I'd like to start um, the presentation um, with a land labor and justice acknowledgement. Do you need next slide? Um, so I'm just going to read through this. I acknowledge the land on which we sit and occupy today as the traditional home of the Duwamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and Suquamish tribal nations. Without them, we would not have access to this working, teaching, and learning environment. I take the opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. I also acknowledge exploited labor, racist, heterosexist, ableist, xenophobic, religious, sexist, and other oppressive violence and the ongoing struggle for justice on this land. I recognize with gratitude all of those who sacrifice struggle and labor make, make our daily freedoms possible and challenge us to learn, work, and live justly. Next slide. Um, so what am I sharing today? Um, I wanted to give you all a, a broader look beyond global oncology at Fred Hutch and, and share a bit about my lived experience, um, my professional journey over the last 20 years, um, sh share about how I, I give back in my everyday, and then I'll go into the program a little bit. Um, Raquel, we are getting some um, notices in the chat that people are having a hard time hearing you. Oh no. <laughs> so I don't know, you might have to kind of hold the mic. By your... Right up to, is this better? Does this work? Yes, that's great. Is that better? Yes. And I'm not seeing the, the slides, unfortunately, um, Jeannie, because of the, the view that I have. So if, um, oh, I changed it, it's fine. I just wanna make sure that we're keeping up together. So is this okay on the on the? Volume? Yeah, it, it, we're, we're getting chat notifications that people um, can hear you now. Okay, wonderful, I apologize for that. You ready for um, the next slide now? Yeah, the next slide. So a little bit about my lived experience. This is a picture of Brooklyn in the 80s, which is where I grew up. Um, so I was born and raised in Brooklyn uh, from immigrant, immigrant Dominican parents and Spanish was my first language. And I lived in a very under-resourced neighborhood. Some people like to call it the ghetto, but I try to stay away from words like that because I think language is really important. So this is truly an under-resourced neighborhood as many still exist today. 
Um, I went back to the DR every summer in my early years to see my parents' families. Um, and then I, I was fortunate to attend a, a free high school for gifted kids in Queens, New York. And during that time, I worked uh, summer jobs and retail jobs throughout. I, of course, was a first generation college student attending Fordham University. And in my junior year, I got pregnant and had a son while I was in college. Um, I stayed on track, even though my parents told me to drop out of school and take care of my kid. I was able to do both and graduate from Fordham University on time. Um, that high school experience was a doozy. It was uh, something that's been replicated in college throughout my first job and many jobs thereafter in that um, it was a gifted and talented school. So guess how many minority students there were? Very, very little. I felt like a true imposter. Um, I was one of a very small group of Latino and Black students at the time. And um, no one had uh, gone through what I had gone through and have been able to um, serve as a mentor for me through high school, through college years as well. Um, I didn't have anyone to help me navigate higher education. So I kind of just figured it out as I thought best. I wanted to go to NYU and actually got into NYU, but um, there, there wasn't a way for me to pay for housing there. And I chose getting out of my house as a priority uh, and went to Fordham University. So my choices were really dependent on what was, um, what was true for me in my environment. And, um, but throughout, I, I did feel the pressure of making my parents proud. I understood that they gave up everything that they knew for the potential of their unborn children at the time to have better opportunities. Um, so that really has driven, uh, it's driven me to get to where I am today and to continue to to push and be motivated to make changes where I see them necessary. Um, next slide. So my professional journey after I graduated Fordham University, I originally wanted to become a, psycho a psychologist. Um, again, without having mentorship, it's really hard to figure out how the heck do you pay for grad school? Um, how do you even become a psychologist without um, having someone to guide your way? Um, and having a young child at the time, I knew I just needed a job. Um, so I landed a job at MSK, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, as a front desk clerk. So I was essentially checking in patients for their chemotherapy um, um, appointments to see their oncologists. Um, and I stayed there for 13 years. I um, was able to work my way up for, you know, the front desk to the running clinics in the back. Um, I learned so much about cancer from just uh, reading the patient charts as I was making appointments for them. Um, and uh, scheduling chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, clinical trial, blood work and appointments. Um, and I eventually ran a pancreatic, a liver, a breast and a sarcoma clinic, um, partnering with the oncologists. This is literally where I learned about oncology. It was reading through diagnoses, treatments, outcomes and understanding where research was still lacking, which um, sadly resulted in, in minimal to no options for, for certain cancer patients. And it really got me hooked to the idea that the efforts that I, that I was um, putting in, though minor, really made a difference to the families as they, uh, in a very vulnerable time. So that's where I got my passion for cancer and cancer research. Um, it was through, through just learning as, as I went through those 13 years of Memorial Sun Kettering. Um, I consistently prided myself in having a good work ethic. I, I needed the job, right? So I made sure that I showed up every day, whether I was um, sick or not, which don't do today in COVID era, but um, I showed up every day and, and built strong, genuine relationships. Um, and that actually carried me to different and new opportunities. So while I was there, I worked towards my master's degree, which was funded by Sloan Kettering. And then I was hired to oversee a virtual brain tumor center, which was my last role there at Sloan Kettering. Uh, next slide. Jeannie, am I talking too fast? You know, I talk too fast because I'm a New Yorker. I think, I think it's just right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I got to check myself. Um, so seven years ago, um, the team that I was working with at the Brain Tumor Center was recruiting, it was recruited to the Hutch. And when uh, the, the opportunity was presented to me, I, I had no idea what even to think. I was born and raised in New York. That's all I knew. 
And um, I thought Seattle might be really cold because it's up north. Um, I had no idea about the communities that existed here. Um, so it took me a long time to say yes. Um, but you know what? I came over here and I saw the mountains. It reminded me of the, the hills and mountains in the Dominican Republic. It gave me a, a certain push to just do it scared. Um, and professionally, it was, it was absolutely the right decision. Um, so I was afraid that I couldn't find community here. I was afraid that the feelings of not belonging were going to be exasperated by being part of an institution that was so white, so lacking of diversity, and that mirrored a lot of the communities here in Seattle. There was, um, this was apparent to me as soon as I visited and it confirmed when I looked up the census and found that there were uh, one percent uh, Caribbean people here. As I said, my parents are from the Dominican Republic and I married um, someone from Puerto Rico. So that community was really important to me having two kids at this time. So like I said, I was scared, but I did it anyway. I moved here with my husband, my teenage son and my young daughter. And um, I, as I said, I uh, was part of this team of 15 that set up a virtual center, just like we did with the Brain Tumor Center back in New York, but this time with eight different tumor sites. So I was overseeing the um, human biology division as the senior director, as well as supporting the Seattle Translational uh, Tumor Research um, Program that we built here. So in the, in the last seven years, I've been promoted three times um, to Associate VP of Research Administration and then Managing Director of Global Oncology, which is the position I have now. Um, it was at that time, about two years ago, that I was uh, looking for something more challenging and something more aligned with what was most important to me, which is to lift, lift up others. Um, and I found that in this opportunity with Global Oncology, I was interim for a while as we were recruiting for managing director and um, fell in love with the program and was fortunate to be, to be hired as a permanent director. Uh, next slide. So my first trip to Uganda last year was uh, quite eye-opening. Um, these are the, the, the top things that I learned right away. And the one being the most important, um, all the people of the world are much more alike than we are different. When I stepped off the, the plane in Uganda, I literally thought of Dominican Republic. Um, the landscape was similar. The people were similar in their warmth. Um, and I just felt more connected than ever. When I, when I was there, even more connected than I felt here in Seattle. Um, in Uganda, I'm a Mizungu, which means foreigner. Um, it's interesting how we're labeled different things throughout the world, um, depending on where you land in. And it actually reminded me that we can't allow our labels to define us. Um, you have to define yourself um, and show the world how you want to be defined. Um, so I was Mizungu and I continue to be Mizungu, but I'm so slowly turning into um, a sister of the soil um, as they, as they um, warmly re um, refer to me. Um, Ugandans are very direct and very giving. That um, really took me back to um, how New Yorkers are very direct and how Dominicans are very giving and very, op very open hearted. So I, f I, I felt at home. Um, I learned that Ensenene is fried grasshoppers and stay away from people offering you treats in October and November because my, my team there told me that they will definitely try to put that in my food because it's a, it's a, like I said, a treat. So <laughs> that was interesting to learn about the different foods. But um, uh, really cool to me was that they use a lot of um, plantains like we use in the Dominican Republic and we just use different words for it like matoke and gonja. Um, so those things just reminded me how connected we are through the, throughout the world. It was my first time in the continent and I felt like I had been there before. Mar Marabou storks are not my favorite. They're the biggest bird I have ever encountered. Um, they look pretty ominous and something to stay away from for sure. Um, they also taught me that quickly showed me that we in the U.S. don't know how to make mo the most of our resources. Um, the way that Ugandans use um, every bit of resource that they have was pretty inspiring. Um, and then seeing how Ugandans participate in their health fully, bringing in family members uh, to take on a nurse's role was again pretty inspiring and some of the things that we can um, definitely bring back to how we do healthcare here. Next slide. 
Um, this is a picture of um, me and the administrator, head administrator of the Uganda Cancer Institute, which is where um, our building sits on that campus. Um, while I was there, I learned that I was the first woman of color to lead the program, which uh, my staff quickly shared with me and um, told me was really important to them to see. Um, and it also showed me or reminded me that you don't see the things as they are. We see things as we are, right? We see things from our experiences and from where we stand in the world. And there's a big difference between um, pity, which engenders a savior mentality, and acceptance of, of differences across the world and your humble place in that story. So I um, had experience uh, with others that came with me on that first trip. Um, the pity in their eyes and they would cry when they, they would see certain situations and that really threw me off. Um, it wasn't my reaction. I, I have seen poverty in many different ways, but I've um, seen the, the, the joy in, in the same people's eyes and I have seen how people can bring themselves together and have a lot to, to show us even through their poverty, which many of my family members have experienced in the Dominican Republic. So it just really felt like I was coming with a different perspective than people that maybe had not had those experiences in the past. Um, so for the past two years, I've been leading the program as a managing director, uh, and I've never felt more fully present and connected to the work I do. It took me going to a place that I had never visited, that I knew nothing about, to feel more connected to the work being led by Fred Hutch here in Seattle. Um, I found a sweet combination of this directness of New Yorkers with the caring and quickly embrace, embracing energy of my Dominicans and my new Ugandan, Ugandan family. Um, and it was truly, uh, I truly felt that, that this is where I needed to be. So it's been the first job I've ever had in 20 plus years, including, you know, my summer work and all my retail jobs, where I don't feel that I have to edit myself to belong. It's truly the opposite. Um, I feel that I, if I don't trust my gut and push for what I think is right, um, then we will not be successful, or at least we'll take much longer to get there. So bringing my whole self to work is of the utmost importance, where in the past, I'd have to edit certain parts out in order to be acceptable. Next slide. A little bit about how I give back. So I mentioned that when I visited Seattle, I was concerned that I couldn't uh, find community. So I did search and search and um, found Education Across Borders, which is a small organization that gives back to the Dominican Republic, building homes, um, funding scholarships and promoting health. Um, and found this group through a Facebook group for Dominicans in Seattle. So I got connected that way and found um, that this organization truly partners with the leaders of these communities and doesn't just um, try to find ways to essentially feel better about ourselves, right? But um, partners and lets the leaders in community lead the way and say what is it that they need for their communities. So I've um, been part of that organization for the past um, five years and have gone to visit to see what we're doing and truly believe in it. So finding things outside of my, my um, work at Fred Hutch has been really important to feel like I'm truly connected and all of my, um, all of my needs are being fulfilled. Next slide. Um, throughout my career, I've also worked really hard towards um, change within my organizations. I have been part of diversity councils and activities to promote change. Um, with the power to hire, once I got into a position where I had that, um, I've also made it a priority to go beyond what HR can offer and insist on identifying um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color applicants for my open roles, which has drastically increased the, di the diversity in my groups. This first picture is when I received a 40 under 40 award from the Puget Sound Business Journal. And that was for a combination of my management accomplishments, my relentless like, ad advocacy for increasing diversity in science, and my volunteer activities um, working to uplift others. An example on the, on the right of um, that was my participation in the State of Women of Color panel this past year. Next slide. So, um, so far, what I have learned matters most to me is to work for an organization that's mission driven and continue to live a life of service, um, to advance strong women and girls in, in all spaces, 
to promote social justice and to spend time nurturing my family. Um, I think this, you know, as a society, we, um, and as women, try to be everything all the time. Um, and I've worked hard to define what actually is important to me rather than be defined by, by how others see me. So these are the top four things that are very important to me and I, and I dedicate my time to. The bottom there, hire, promote, celebrate, retain BIPOC um, individuals is um, something that I have worked on throughout my career and continue to um, feel like it's part of my responsibility, not something that um, I choose and want to do, but truly part of my fiber and something I will continue to do for the rest of my life. So these are just pictures of me in Uganda with um, a nurse of the, at the Uganda Cancer Institute, the Hutch United group here in Fred Hutch, which um, I'm on the board for. Um, my daughter in front of a sign that's as perfect as boring. I try to make her as weird, uh, be comfortable being as weird as possible. Um, a Black Lives Matter um, sign that she's holding that we used for one of the marches that we, we participated in. And um, my son, my husband, and you know, my family here in Seattle on the bottom. Next slide. So these are the places that I um, spend my time in throughout the year. Um, Brooklyn, as I mentioned, is my home hometown, and I go back there. Or I, you know, pre-COVID, I go about twice twice a year. Seattle, where I currently live, I'm in a great public, um, which is where the organization that I volunteer for um, does work. Uh, Puerto Rico, which is where my husband um, is from, and we visit grandma there, and then Kampala, Uganda. So those um, five places is where I spend the t my my split my time throughout the year, and hope to continue to be able to travel in the future. Um, for the time being, I'll focus on things that we can get done virtually. Next slide. So I'll spend the rest of the time going um, over what we do in Uganda um, through the Uganda uh, Cancer Institute Fred Hutch Partnership. Um, so as, a mis uh, as our mission, the program um, generates cancer research that has global impact and supports the development of research capacity and clinical care to reduce the burden of cancer in low and middle income countries. That's just our, our mission, but we truly are situated in Kampala, Uganda. Um, our collaborative work with the UCI is uh, carried out, out on their campus in a state of the art facility for research training and clinical care, which opened in May, 2015. It features um, a 25,000 square foot facility, which includes training, a training center, research labs and capabilities, as well as four outpatient clinics. Um, these uh, outpatient clinics are um, our main source of recruitment for our clinical trials. Um, so they happen on the first floor of the building, which is um, continuously open. And we have um, shared conference room space um, and really just mentioning it as uh, so, so it's clear that it uh, looks like our building here in Seattle with the red brick, but it truly is a collaborative building that the UCI uses as well. Next slide. Um, our research focuses on several different um, cancer types and uh, viruses. Um, so a lot of our patients that have um, cancer also have HIV. Um, and the number one, as a side note, the number one um, disease that HIV patients die of is cancer. Um, it goes untreated. So a lot of patients come um, very late stage. Um, so some of the work that we do is to get education out there so that uh, patients know what are the signs um, and symptoms to look out for to then come and get treatment at the UCI. But these are the, the diseases that we focus on with the current open research studies. Next slide. A few highlights. Um, of what we've been able to collaboratively accomplish in the last uh, 10 years. Um, some of the most notable is the increase of, increase of oncologists from one to 14, which impressively um, uh, includes uh, mostly Ugandans at UCI, which have returned to the UCI. A lot of this training happens here in Seattle in collaboration with the, with the University of Washington, um, either in person or virtually. And for many um, different uh, uh, training programs across the world, you will see um, 
fellows and trainees leave that organization to go work for some more, uh, somewhere else. I think it's uh, very, um, it's notable that for our program that the oncologists for the most part will stay at the UCI so that there is an increase um, of availability to, to, um, to treatments and um, we're able to bring on those oncologists to the research studies that we open so that they're learning the same at the same time that we are um, and bringing ba that back to, to the UCI for treatment. Um, to the opening of clinical trials, over 200 pediatric patients have received compre comprehensive case management and care for Burkitt's lymphoma, which is really notable as well. Um, so what I, what I have found, which was interesting to me, is that um, you know, clinical trials take a long time to, to make a difference, right? There's many years of, of learning what works and um, taking a step forward and taking two steps back and continuing. Um, but because of the, of the um, allowances that are funded through the clinical trials, for example, we can pay for patients to come to the UCI for treatment where um, if they weren't on this clinical trial, they might not be able to afford just a transportation to get on that on that campus. There's a lot of um, peripheral uh, supplements that we're able to, to, to give because we have uh, the clinical trial funding, which I think is really, um, is really important to note and makes a, an impact immediately on the patient population. Next slide. Um, this is a, an org chart of our global oncology faculty and staff. I know it's, it's pretty small and hard to see, but I put it up here um, to show you that most of our employees are Ugandan employees, which is uh, shown, in, shown in yellow. The blue is our Seattle staff. And there are um, up to s about 60 employees in Uganda. There's uh, more than what's shown here because the, the clinical teams are um, under certain trials are not all fleshed out here. But um, importantly, the blue um, on the right-hand side, which is the team that reports into me, um, is a is a group of people that do not have a science background. So in Seattle, we have a finance manager, we have an operations manager that takes care of um, the the facilities oversight, amongst other things. We have a program manager that handles our communications, um, that works with philanthropy. Um, we have an admin coordinator that supports the faculty directly. We have a research manager that's in charge of submitting grants and, and receiving um, funded awards, and a regulatory manager that makes it possible for us to get approval for our clinical trials. So all of those are US-based jobs that you can have without having a science background or experience. And there's a lot of jobs like that at Fred Hutch where I would have never guessed, you know, going into college, I would have never guessed that that I could have an opportunity to work for a cancer center without having a science background. And I think, you know, if you've heard talks before, there's several people that, that do mention this. I mean, we have literally every job that you would have, that, that any big business would have. Um, so, so I encourage you to explore different ways to be part of the Hutch. It doesn't have to be through a science background. I don't have a science background. Um, you can travel to Uganda in, this, in these support roles, and they're very integral to the success of the program. So I just wanted to mention them um, as a way uh, into this organization and or other organizations that you may feel are not um, possible for you because of your experience. Next slide. So the current activity at um, the UCI, or through the collaboration, I should say, um, it's happening through 18 funded grant, grants across uh, 10 diseases, and those 18 grants um, have nine Ugandan investigators attached to it. Everything that we do is in collaboration with the Ugandan investigators. Our clinical trials and our grants go in with collaborators um, every time. Um, like I said, there's about 60 plus uh, members in our multidisciplinary team. And we have two interventional trials open now, which means that the patients or the participants are getting some benefits from being on the trial. Um, there's laboratory research, which I mentioned, and then there's training. 
um, through virtual tumor boards, fellowship programs, and others. So pulling in as much um, or sharing as much information as possible, um, and and especially now it's 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 you know it's it's apparent to everyone that we can do a lot of things virtually instead of assuming that we can't do it and leave um, others out that can benefit. Next slide. So during uh, COVID, there had to be, there um, there were a lot of adaptations that needed to be put in place in order for patients to continue to be treated and our research and operations to continue. Um, and what's in place now at the UCI is uh, screening of every person accessing campus. Um, there's mandatory masking and there's uh, hand washing that's mandatory. Um, only participants receiving direct benefits or receiving some type of intervention are brought onto campus in order to minimize the density on campus. Um, we've incorporated telehealth um, and that's including um, uh, texting patients using WhatsApp and different modes to make sure that information is getting to the patient, um, which is wasn't really being used in the past. Um, it was uh, more like if you couldn't get to campus, then um, you're out of luck or there's very little that we can do for you or we'll send you to another location that may be um, just as far. So I think with the fact that there was so many patients that couldn't come onto campus, um, again, because of um, social distancing regulations, but also because of the lack of, of public transportation through um, government shutdown, the incorporation of tele telehealth really was um, a necessity um, instead of a nice to have. Um, the awareness and support of peripheral participant benefits, like somebody mentioned, the transportation for clinical visits, um, we, we saw the importance of continuing that even though some of our clinical trials were shut down. So we found ways around um, that shutdown to continue to be able to support that. And then um, uh, broader communication models. Um, so there were some of our staff that weren't getting on campus, where, which is where their primary computers were and um, didn't have enough data on their, on their phones in order to continue to be available um, um, for phone calls, et cetera. So there was uh, different ways that we had to consider communicating to make sure that everyone was, was getting the information. Next slide. So some of the things that we've been thinking about um, that can definitely be carried into the future. Um, so the prioritizing of funding and resources for uh, cancer care. So there's uh, new access to, to sinks right in the entryway of the Uganda Cancer Institute. That's something that um, has always been needed, but it took something like this to then prioritize the funding to, to make it possible. And a, a sink may seem like a minor thing, but it's um, huge when it comes to um, mitigating uh, the risk of viruses and other diseases. So that is that hand washing is actually mandatory before you um, get onto campus. Um, and then telehealth, like I, like I mentioned, and, and the need for increased healthcare uh, workforce continues to be something that needs to be prioritized in the budgets. Um, sustainable solutions and models incorporating on-site training and capacity building. This is something that has been um, looked at really closely and we're working with the UCI to share some of the models that we have in place here. Again, because it seems now that it's such a critical need um, and where before it was a nice to have. Um, and then funding for treatment delivery options that allow broader access for patients. So one of our clinical trials is testing the efficacy of having a oral chemotherapy treatment. So the patient gets a, essentially a, a, a pill instead of getting um, an infusion. So as you can imagine, you can give um, a treatment for a month um, at a time by giving them a, a, a full prescription that they can take home um, versus them coming onto campus to get that chemotherapy treatment. So that has been um, of the utmost importance, or the importance during this time and actually has um, been tested or has been used here as well for some of our breast uh, cancer patients that can't make it onto campus. So using what we're learning there to, to be able to provide more access to our patients here as well. Next slide. This is um, my team in Uganda. This is the last time that I was there, which was in January. We had an all staff retreat. Um, 
and uh, we got a lot of our members here to go there and participate. Um, it was going to be the, the start of a new way of collaborating. Um, unfortunately, that got a little sidetracked uh, because of COVID, but we have a lot of uh, great positive energy that came out of that and new initiatives that um, the team here in Seattle can partner with our team in Uganda to, to make happen. So this is just a happy picture of the team and I miss them so much. Um, next slide. Um, so this is uh, the end of my talk. The, some of the things that I definitely want to leave with you and hopefully came across is um, do it scared. Uh, do it without the experience. Um, do it even if you feel less than, which I still have those moments that, that I do. Um, prepare as much as you can. This is the age of information. I think people, um, everyone now has a ton more information than uh, 20 years ago when I was in school. Um, make connections before you need them, which leads to stay ready so that you don't have to get ready. Um, something I try to teach my, my daughter all the time. Um, and bring your whole self in, even when it feels scary. Um, I think, you know, I, I said that this is the first job where I felt that I could uh, bring my whole self in, that I didn't have to edit any part of myself in order to be successful. So I know that maybe that's not possible in every moment, but I encourage you to do that um, as much as, as you can and, and push the envelope when you can and when you feel safe to do so. Um, and take care of your mental health and your emotional health. Get out of your, your own way um, because all of, who you are, who, all of who you are makes up how you show up in every environment. Um, and remember that your story or your lived experience is what um, makes you unique and it's truly your asset. And I think that um, this job that I'm in now um, really has taught me that that those parts of me make me different than others that have had this role before and make it possible for me to connect quickly um, and to be able to engender trust quickly. So there's things that because of your background, you bring that are unique and find ways to make that your asset instead of editing it out. Next slide. This is my thank you slide with a little monkey that was um, joining me for dinner one of the times that I was there. Um, I hope this was um, helpful for you and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate uh, the honesty and the kind of truth that you bring to your speaking. And um, for those of you who might not know, um, I used to report to Raquel before she joined this current position with Global Oncology in Uganda. And I can also um, thank her for being a real advocate for science education. So especially in her prior role, she was in the, in the position to really help out and um, advance our, our uh, abilities to make a difference in science education. So also a big proponent and supporter of, of that work. So I'm really grateful for, um, everything that she's done for our program. Um, so yeah, I, I invite you now to either put questions into the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask a question directly. Um, and uh, this is gonna get us started. Sometimes it takes a moment for people to write into the chat. Um, I can I can ask you one question that came up yeah. for me. So um, I, I really like when you touched on the fact that you were learning from the experiences there and bringing that back here, because I think, you know, part of um, attitude that kind of can come with that savior kind of mentality that you're talking about would be that, you know, it's all like kind of one directional, mm -hmm. but you mentioned there's also things that we learn from the experience there that we can bring back. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit, because I found that was a really powerful idea. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so one is scientifically, right? What, what kind of access are we working towards there that we can bring back here? You know, there's a lot of um, patients that would benefit from getting treatment at, at our cancer center, but you know, live too far away, don't have access to transportation, et cetera. So focusing on treatments that can be um, delivered um, quickly or um, taken off site to those sites, I think is really important thing to continue to explore. So 
two of our clinical trials actually are exploring um, a quicker, more um, efficient, more accessible delivery. So I think that that's of utmost importance. But another thing to mention is, you know, um, my team here in Seattle gets to see me every day or did before COVID. Um, and now I feel like everybody's on the same playing field. Um, and it challenges me to make sure that I'm, um, uh, that I'm being very conscious of the way that I communicate with them. Um, and also to be conscious that, again, that, like I mentioned before, that I'm not, um, I'm not uh, assuming that um, because we are um, not connected in, in person that um, there's different opportunities that, that, that I can't offer them. So, so because we're all virtual, I have to think of, of uh, the way that I interact and provide opportunities differently. So I think mm -hmm. that, that that challenge is really important for everyone to, to think about and not um, dismiss things as, as impossible because mm -hmm. we're virtual. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you. A question from one of our teachers, Danielle. Um, who said she really enjoyed the talk. And can you say more about how you, need, you needed to edit yourself, especially in the high school setting? Absolutely. So I went to a high school with very privileged kids. Um, I found myself um, uh, not every time there was a conversation going on that I wanted to be a part of, I would find myself uh, questioning whether I should share those moments that were real for me with this group or whether it's safe to share those moments with this group or because I'm assuming they didn't have the experiences I did that they wouldn't understand that they would judge me and, and, and um, that I wouldn't have um, a connection with them. So there was constant editing of, of that conversation in my head before I would speak, right? Um, which I assume made me, um, made made me look like I wasn't maybe as smart because I wasn't participating as much um, as engaged. Um, so so for me in the classroom and in the social groups, it was constant editing and um, I was uh, mostly very quiet because of that. Mm -hmm. And it was because I was questioning whether my lived experience was going to be acceptable to share. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's I'm sure that um, there's some students that could probably relate to that, that feeling too. Um, thank you for, for sharing about that. Other questions for Raquel? I have a question that's kind of elaborating on that last one. Um, you, on the flip side, you talk about how now you're able to be your whole self and bring your whole self to your current job. And I think, especially for the students on the call, hearing you talk about that a little bit more and the specifics of how you are able to be your full authentic self at your workplace um, could be very helpful. So if you could say more on that, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I tend to be very expressive when I'm around my family. And that's probably the safest place I feel, right? So when I go back to New York and um, I'm with my mom and my sisters, um, I talk very freely, I connect very easily. And I felt that when I went to Uganda and I met the team there, because they reminded me of that energy, I felt like I could bring that energy as well. And that quickly allowed me to connect to them, that quickly allowed me to get real with them. And I was able to get down to some of the, the issues that were brewing um, in in one-on-one -on -one conversations and the the trust was really there. So what I mean by not editing or being my my whole self is being true to to who I am and how I want to show up. Um, whereas um, I felt like um, here in in Seattle when I first got here and in the environments that I was in I was constantly watching other people seeing how they were showing up and in a way um you know faking the funk right fake it till you make it um which which to me has always been mimic others that I see as successful without realizing that um if you're showing up that way, you'll, you'll never fully show up and, and be proud of what you're showing, right? So I thought that acknowledging that I had imposter syndrome, acknowledging that I didn't look or sound like other people in the room and just mimicking was enough. Um, as long as I knew what I was doing, that that was enough. But that um, completely 
it's like putting yourself in your, your own box. Um, and, and, and once you can fully show up as yourself, um, professionally, however that means to you, there's so much more that you can offer because you're not constantly thinking about those things. Right. So I feel like now in this job that that's what I can offer. And I have, you know, gut feelings about certain things that we should be doing, saying how we should be communicating, how should we be interacting with each other that, um, if I don't see happening in those ways, I have those conversations now because I know how important it is to people that connect in the same way that I do. Mm-hmm. Is that helpful? Okay. <laughs> Awesome. Um, so I was wondering, like, why Uganda? Like, how did it get to be Uganda? And, and what are the, some of the other places where Fred Hutch is, is working and, um, you know, potentially working into the future in terms of global support? So Fred Hutch is working all over the world through uh, clinical trial collaborations. So it's not, it's not just Uganda. It's, um, it's um, almost every continent. Um, we're certainly in South America. We're certainly in Asia. Um, in Europe, um, all over. But in Uganda, it's the, it, it's, Uganda is the only place where we have a brick and mortar. We have a 10 year long collaboration with the, with the um, only cancer center there. And um, that pre, the Uganda Ca- Cancer Institute's involvement with um, NIH funding, for example, um, predates our collaboration. But they were set up um, to, to have a partnership with the NIH early on and we found that to be a way for us to to build a collaboration that could be funded in the future right so funding is a major piece of that um, and Burkitt lymphoma being one of the first diseases that was um, studied there um, gave us um, uh, a reason to to connect with the Uganda Cancer Institute to build up on their Bergen lymphoma research. So there was training already happening with the current um, director through the NIH. Um, mm-hmm. So it was a connection that was established where we could, um, where we, we had a basically a, a foot in the door. Mm-hmm. Good. Um, your day to day, like what, what, what does your day look like? Because it's, it's hard to phone, imagine. Phone calls, <laughs> phone calls and emails. <laughs> but in terms of like you, what you consider your major responsibilities too for your job, like what are you mostly focusing on, like projects you're working on right now, for example? Yeah, so for, for now and since March, it really has been um, sharing and implementing as much as we, uh, as, as, as many of the things that we've implemented here during the COVID time to implement there in Uganda. So the latest one was our um, mandatory screening tool that we have to use here at Fred Hutch. So whenever uh, any one of us needs to go into campus, we're required to have a symptoms check and get cleared electronically. Um, before we can go in and that you know that serves to remind us of all the symptoms of this disease and or this virus and um, and also um, allows us to do contact tracing so the center knows who's on campus when they're on campus if there's an outbreak so I work to implement that for our Ugandan colleagues and the Uganda Cancer Institute was so interested in in it as well so we also implemented it for them so now there's a tool that's available to both our employees in Uganda and all employees in Uganda Cancer Institute. And we've extended it to anyone that, that is on campus um, that they want to make pan- mandatory to use it. So things like that, tools that are you know, outside of, 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 the, of the research itself um, that we can use to support the research and support the operations there, um, I'm involved in. Um, there's a, um, what we call the ground floor build out that's happening right now on campus. So there's um, that building that I'll show you a picture of. Um, there's, um, uh, they, we don't like to call it a basement, but essentially um, the ground floor is being built out so that we can um, have uh, everyone um, in the same building at the same time. So our administrative team is offsite somewhere else. So managing that construction and, and what that's going to look like for our teams is, is another project that's in flight right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and then our, our most important really is getting our research trials back up and running. So the, all of our trials were shut down in March and the um, Uganda, Uganda National 
science and technology um, group um, has asked for research management plans to see what kind of precautions we'll put in place to make sure that patients are safe to be on trials. So we worked hard on pulling that together and that's including, you know, how, how much we're cleaning, um, how are we ensuring for physical distancing, um, how are you ensuring that symptoms checks are happening, things like that to make sure that patients and participants are safe. So those have just been put in and we're waiting on approval for that. So then managing the ramp up of, of activity back on campus is a huge part of, of what I think about on a weekly basis. And that includes two 6 a.m. calls um, a week um, just to have the, the, the heads of all the departments online to make sure that whatever um, we're implementing makes sense um, on the ground there. I'd like to invite, if there's any students who have questions, I'd like to invite uh, our students or interns to, to go ahead and uh, either unmute or put something in the chat. Remember what she said about courage. <laughs> I'm scared all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, where else in the world would you like to visit, like your Uganda visit? Oh, man, there's so many places. Um, there's so many places. I, I haven't been to many, so on my list um, is, is um, Peru. Um, I have a friend that's been working there with a um, NGO for many years, um, so I, I would love to go visit Peru and visit her and see see what that's about. Um, you know, it, it, it completely energizes me to be around um, people that I can connect to, so um, that I can connect to easily. So South America is definitely on my list next. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. How long do you usually stay in Uganda? Um, so I should be if we if we if we can travel again i should be going about once a quarter or at minimal three times a year and when i go i stay for um two to three weeks at a time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and i think you fred hutch has a has a a guest house or a place that they're renting often is that the we did have a house which we actually just closed out yesterday mm -hmm. um we've had that house for many years um but unfortunately because of um you know not traveling and budget yeah. cuts it didn't make sense for us to continue to keep the project house yeah. um so it was bittersweet but we we, we had to close it out yeah yeah, yeah. now that makes yeah. sense yeah good mm -hmm. one of the things that i really liked about your talk was also the message about like how much um, of science, um, you know, is there's all kinds of jobs in a science institution mm -hmm. like Fred Hutch and how many different roles, like, especially when you said like anything, you know, things that you would find in a business kinds yeah. of jobs, like pro project management and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of data analysis. And so what, when, when you think about like a student who want, might be interested in being involved in, in, um, a research institute, but not necessarily in science. Like, what do you see as really promising um, areas of growth or development? Like, what would you recommend for those kind of students? Does it help you, for example, to have an MBA in your role? Um, you know, I, I I'm on the fence about degrees in general. Um, I think that experience trumps uh, degrees any day. Um, but in order to get certain roles in certain organizations, they still require them, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think that my MBA helps me in this role. I think that um, what it helped me do was to think differently and to be exposed to different methodologies, but you can do that um, in a library. Um, you can do that in, in participating in different um, online conferences, right? So, so I think just seeking information is really important. So I, I'm, mm -hmm. I just, I feel a certain way about degrees yeah. and that whole discussion. Yeah. Um, but um, to answer your question about what's, you know, what kind of positions, I think, I think general project management is um, really important and being in a support role, doesn't matter if it's, you know, in, in, in healthcare or not, but having the experience of being in a support role, if you're coming, um, 
if you're if you're just just trying to get a new person trying to get into an organization that type of experience or education is really important because it it would allow you to um be eligible for for many different groups across the hutch if we're talking about the hutch so most groups have pro a project manager in one way or another um, most grants um, that are comprehensive for not so not small grants that are just um, um, led by one PI but multi project grants need a project manager um, and that's really just to keep everything um, aligned and make sure that it's moving forward and that all of the regulations are being followed etc um, so I think someone that has a uh, sup supporting role type of experience with project management is is really helpful to allow you to have a lot of different um, um, access access points, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. We have time for maybe one or two more. Um, do you take high school students, interns, or job shadow <laughs> visits? Um, I don't think that Global Oncology has in the past. My, my plan was to do that um, this summer. I've implemented an internship in, in every role that I've had. Um, if I have hiring power, I will implement an internship. Um, I truly believe that they make a difference and um, I don't um, take no for an answer. So yes, yeah, so I, so I would have had one. Um, but again, going back to, you know, don't let this virtual world be an excuse for not doing something. I am committed to supporting Jeannie and in, in, in um, whatever um, internship type of opportunities that we can come up with um, as an organization and I'd, I'd be happy to participate in those. Yeah. Um, science education wise, what are some goals you have for education here in Seattle? Um, what would I, so maybe what would you like to see from science education in Seattle? From science education? Yeah. Hmm. Um, I'm impressed with everything that I've learned through Jeannie, honestly. Um, I think that, you know, I, I'm, I don't know what the numbers look like. I, I do think that we need to bring more of this to different communities that can't access it um, by coming to our campus. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure how much of that we do, but yeah. I, there's never, there's never enough. Right. Um, so showing uh, kids different ways to participate in science other than, being a scientist, um, of course, including being a scientist, but there's so many ways that that can look like that I think is important for, for kids to, to be aware of. My, my 12 year old daughter says she wants to be a scientist. I mean, she's an arts kid. I'm like, are you serious? Um, okay, be a scientist, right? There's so many ways you can do that. Yeah. Um, so so um, I, you know, I've been fortunate to be able to expose her to different things, but um, I would say that her arts friends are not thinking I'm gonna be a scientist, right? Yeah. Um, so I think just bringing, bringing um, more resources into settings that are just don't have that access is it makes a big difference yeah. well your story was wonderful and you can really see you know looking back on it how all the different pieces added up to bring you to the this role that just seems to be such a good match for for you and i'm so happy about about that um i'm going to switch over to our uh closing slides but while i do feel free to um unmute yourself throw up some um, reactions and uh, you can also turn on your video if you're so inclined to uh, thank our speaker today. And I'll switch over to my slides here. Yay. Okay. And um, I wanted to remind you that we have a schedule up on our SEP events page. Uh, also, there are recordings from all the previous speakers. Um, I think we have uh, something like 16 or 17 um, sessions that we've had now. So there's a, a really broad range of different kinds of um, talks. I encourage you to check it out. Next week, we have a a program with a very interesting title, Thymus, the most important organ you've never heard of. And uh, Dr. Jared Dudikoff is really into the thymus. So you will definitely learn a lot about the thymus and it, it promises to be fascinating. Um, he's an assistant professor uh, program in, in immunology and also in our clinical research uh, division at Fred Hutch. And um, then after that, we're gonna take a break uh, during the school year, we, we may go to once a month. 
uh, interspersing that with some virtual field trips, which will be a new offering. So we're going to try that out. And um, please, you know, keep keep looking at our newsletter and um, watch for our communications about future um, Hutch at Home. But just wanted to thank everybody who joined us today. And please, again, a uh, big thank you for Raquel. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks, Raquel. Right, thank you. Yeah. That was awesome. And we do have a feedback form if you uh, would like to give us some feedback on the talk. Um, you can use the feedback form there and uh, look forward to, to hearing from, from you. Thanks again, Raquel. It was, that was wonderful. <laughs>